lightweight, portable, innovative. Tesco 6330 Meter Sight Analyzer is the most versatile and complete tool for testing the entire functionality of transformer rated metering installations. Contact us today for a free demo. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Let me get the, uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so this morning we're doing uh, history of electric metering. Um, and despite what Andy tells you, I have not been around for all of the history of electric metering, uh, but it is a really fun topic. It's a great introduction um, to the industry, but it's also a great refresher for guys that have been in the industry their entire careers. There is so much of what we do in electric metering that ties back to what we did back in the 1800s, believe it or not. Um, and so some of the things where people say, well, we do it that way because we've been doing it that way forever. That's exactly right. We have been doing it that way forever. Sometimes there's really good reasons for it. Sometimes not so much, but at least you understand what the reason is and you know what we can do. All right. Um, so with that said, let's, uh, let's jump in. We've got an hour. I will try really hard to make time at the end of the session for questions and answers, but this is a, a, a pretty full, sometime. I've given this presentation where I've had 90 minutes and even two hours to give it. So there's gonna be a lot in here. Uh, if I don't have time for some of the questions, please just reach out after, uh, reach out afterwards and we're happy to, uh, we're always happy to talk about metering and we're certainly happy to answer any of the questions. All right. So these are some some of the things that we are going to talk about. You know, um, basically, uh, prior around 1870, when we start with the history of metering, some of the uh, early metering luminaries. You know, you'll see a lot of the same names because remember, in the late 1800s, these guys were effectively inventing the industry. There was no there was no infrastructure. They were making it up as they went. So these, of course, are some of the guys that are involved, and you'll you'll hear their names quite a bit. Some of them are known pretty well to you. Thomas Edison, George Westinghouse. We are going to talk about Nikola Tesla, although not so much on the metering side, but we will talk a little bit about him. Um, Thomas Duncan, uh, you know, Westinghouse and Duncan are certainly guys that have been in the industry for a while, or if you guys have seen a lot of old meters, those are names that you see on a lot of old meters out there. AC versus DC, uh, the meter manufacturers, um, how meterings change, and we're going to take it all the way through um, to today. All right, so we got we got lots to cover. All right, let's step back just a little bit to uh, Mr. Franklin, uh, who is a uh, born in Boston, but a great son of Philadelphia. Uh, when we do our users group, we actually like to have there is a really good Ben Franklin um, uh, character actor who his entire career is basically spent portraying Ben Franklin and doing tours of the city and historical discussions. The first time we had him for our users group, he came and he spoke for a full hour about Franklin's experiments in electricity, all right? Franklin is the person who actually named the battery. Um, this is, uh, there's a picture over here, this little uh, uh, Leyden jar that he has, which is really a series of capacitors, but he thought that they looked a bit like cannons sticking out from fortifications. So he called it a battery. Um, that's where the name comes from. Same thing as battery of cannons um, or a battery of artillery. All right. Um, Franklin thought, uh, Franklin had this great idea about electricity. He thought it would be perfect for powering a rotisserie, for example. At one point, Franklin actually invited a bunch of friends over for an electric dinner. For this electric dinner, he electrocuted a turkey um, and he used an electric rotisserie to carve the turkey. He also put an electric charge up through all of the goblets at the dinner so that every guest as they were sipping their drinks would get an electric charge. Um, he thought this was the most clever thing in the world and his guests evidently enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, so he was a huge pioneer of electricity, all right? Ironically, he publishes a lot of his early works in this, um, uh, because in those days, these scientists corresponded quite a bit. The guys in Europe, the guys in America, they're constantly corresponding, publishing papers, writing private letters. 
Um, he publishes this little um, group of electrical experiments, and it becomes an instant sensation throughout the, uh, the Western world. But it becomes, everybody overlooks his electric rotisserie and some of his other things because of the lightning rod. The lightning rod was huge. He ends up founding an insurance company, um, and he figures out that by putting lightning rods up on people's homes, he would insure against fire, and you would put a little emblem on your house. So if there was a fire, his own fire company would come out and put out your fire. But if the neighbor who didn't have an emblem on their house had a fire, they didn't come out and put out the fire. And he knew that with, an, with a lightning rod up there, your house was less likely to get struck by lightning and catch fire. Um, but everybody seizes on the lightning rod and they kind of forgot a lot about what was going on with his electric power. He eventually sees that steam is coming on and realizes that electricity doesn't have the potential, pun intended, to overcome steam, at least not at the time. A little bit later, Mr. Alessandro Volta actually comes up with the first batteries, and yes, we named the Volt after him, so you'll see a lot of those, a lot of those names. Mr. Faraday comes up with the idea of electromagnetism, uh, okay, uh, kind of comes up with the idea of induction and hydroelectricity um, back in the 1830s, and yep, that's where we get Faraday cages and things from, all right? Um, he builds the first electric motor, the first generator, the first transformer. So again, these guys are starting to figure this stuff out, but so far, you know, nothing commercial. Arc lamps, arc lamps actually come out around 1800, 1802, the first arc lamp is out there. But the problem is there's no source of electricity. There's no constant or reliable source of electricity. There's no generators, all right? Well, they come up with dynamos again in the 1830s. Um, by the 1850s, they're improving them and they actually put them into commercial use in the 1870s. By 1880, Charles Brush of the Brush Electric Company is lighting Broadway, okay? Everybody thinks that Edison is the one who lit up New York City and lit up Broadway. Nope, it was Charles Brush. So what do we call those things in our motors? We still call them brushes, don't we? After Mr. Charles Brush, all right? So Mr. Brush is the one who lights up Broadway and he does it with AC, he does it with arc lights um, two years before Edison begins uh, producing his, uh, his power on Pearl Street, all right? So what makes it practical? What makes it practical are these dynamos in the 1870s. Well, as soon as electricity is commercially viable, Guess what we need? We need meters. All right. So in 1872, we have our first meter. All right. This first meter is basically a clock with an electromagnet. All right. By 1878, we have an AC and we have a DC meter. And these are effectively clocks because on the circuit, nobody has invented a switch. So however many lights you have on your circuit, that's what you got. You can't turn them on or off. So all they had to do was figure out how many lights you had on and how long you had them on for. That was the extent of the metering. In a lot of ways, that's still how a lot of municipalities get billed for their street lights. It's simply how much time do you have them on? How many street lights do you have? How much does each one pull in energy? Here's your bill. Okay, it's a, it's a very simple way to meter. It's a very simple way to mill, bill. All right, notice what's on the, what's on the face of that, um, of that meter. Does that look familiar? Yes, it does, because originally it was nothing more than a clock. That's what started it, and guess what? We still had those dials on our, all of our electromechanical meters. Well, most of them. We did have some that just uh, had more like an odometer but the overwhelming majority looked like that, all right? Um, but once you could independently turn a light on and off, flat, mate, flat rate metering went right out the window. So you had to come up with something new. There were lots of ideas, some of them good and some of them bad. Everything's that, everybody thinks, rightly so, that Thomas Edison was some level of genius. Of course, he would often say that it would only be, uh, Somebody mute there, Andy. Thank you. 
Um, he would often say that, uh, that it was 1% inspiration and 99% sweat. There was a lot of effort in the labs, a lot of uh, trial and error, but not all of his ideas were very good. He had an idea for a meter. He had an idea for a chemical meter we'll talk about a little bit later. It was a terrible idea. All right. Um, this is Mr. Fuller's um, idea. This was the first AC meter. And again, I mentioned it before, this was simply a clock operated by uh, the alternating fields between the two coils. And again, you can see the dial. So this was really the first AC meter. And it was done by, uh, it was done by one of the key guys at the Fort Wayne Electric Company, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. All right. So all we had was flat rate billing because electricity in the 1870s, primarily telephone and telegraph, that's what most of the electricity was being used for, and brush, uh, brushes arc lamps that were connected in series. So all you really needed to know was how long was it on, how much is it drawing when it's on, and they, they had a unit of measure that was called lamp hours. Pretty brilliant, right? Okay. Um, Edison, people liked Edison's incandescent lamps. Why did they love them? They didn't give out more light. The arc lamp gave out more light, but they loved the softer glow. That was closer to candlelight. Everybody felt comfortable with it. Everybody was familiar with it. Once again, flat rate tariff charged by the number of bulbs. All right. Now, Thompson and Houston, we'll talk about them. They're two engineers originally from Connecticut. Um, they changed the game. They came up with a circuit where you could turn lights on and off. Brand new concept. It's every day we do that in our lives. We don't even think about it. This was huge in the late 1870s, early 1880s when they uh, came out with it. Um, this was absolutely huge. Um, Thompson Housen, again, two engineers, formed in 1883. Mr. Charles Coffin. Um, actually bought them. He was a financier. The engineers weren't doing a very good job running the company. He bought the company out and brought the American Electric Company to Lynn, Massachusetts from Connecticut. Okay. Um, actually, he renamed the company they started out was the American Electric Company to kind of assuage them a little bit to, or to make them feel better about it. He renamed the company in their honor because they were the ones that had all the intellectual property and had come up with all the ideas. So he renamed it the Thompson Houston Electric Company. All right, Edison, again, late 1870s, 1879, comes up with his light bulb. All right, originally, light only, that's all he was using his stuff for. The Pearl Street Station that he comes up with a few years later, that's basically all they're doing is powering electric light bulbs, all right? His idea at the time, just deliver batteries, DC batteries, directly to the user. He had carts, horses and carts, dragging electric batteries through the streets of New York City, delivering the batteries to the users. Um, he comes up with the Edison Illuminating Company, realizes that delivering batteries may not be the most efficient way to promote electricity, so he develops the Pearl Street Power Plant. If you go up to Michigan, there is a great museum started by the, uh, the Ford Foundation up there. Um, and uh, Ford was a huge, huge fan of Edison's. He actually buys the entire um, Pearl Street station in uh, Manhattan after it's obsolete many years later and moves it up to Detroit and puts it into his museum. It's a, it's a great, great museum up there. And you can actually walk through the Pearl Street station, the whole thing. He had one generator originally. Uh, produced power for 800 electric light bulbs. A little over a year later, they had 12,000, over 12,000 electric light bulbs on there. So it became immensely popular immediately. All right. Uh, let's see here. Why is that? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. So... As DC is becoming um, more and more prevalent and Edison's light bulbs are becoming well accepted, those arc lamps are also becoming well accepted because they provide so much light. Where do the arc lamps become really well accepted? For street lights and things of this nature. 
And yes, it really was formed by a na man named Ronald T. McDonald. Um, you can't make this stuff up. Um, and he was more the financier. Again, he, he uh, starts the Fort Wayne Electric Company. Uh, Edison starts up his first illuminating company. And we now need more precise metering. So Thompson Houston, that electric, the, these two engineers, they come up with a, uh, uh, with a walking beam meter. The walking beam meter was actually really accurate. However, it was so complex and so fragile that out in the field, it never worked properly. In the lab, it worked great. But pretty quickly, they figured out that if they were going to actually do metering in the field, they needed something that was way more robust. And they learned from that. And these guys come out with the first successful meter called the Thompson Recording Watt Meter. All right. Um, but they learned from this walking beam meter that complex and highly accurate was not a substitute for robustness. Still needed accuracy but it needed to be really robust. And if you think about it, some of our electromechanical meters, all of you guys who have been in metering for any period of time, you will come across 40, 50, 60, 70 year old meters that are still working beautifully. When you bring them back to the lab and test them, they're still up at 99.9% .9 something, 99.8% something after 60 and 70 years outside in the elements. So here's Edison's first shot at a meter. It was a chemical meter. He said, oh, you know what? There is a direct proportion in the, uh, in the buildup of material. It's an, anodizing, it's, a, it's an anodizing type process. So I'm gonna build up material and all I really have to do is weigh the plates at the end of a period of a time. And I know the relationship between the amount of electricity used and the amount of buildup on the plates. This is perfect. I'll get a really accurate way to measure the electrical consumption of the customer. The trouble is that you had to bring those plates back to the lab. Customers weren't thrilled because they couldn't actually see what was going on and they would just get this mysterious bill a couple of days later. Well, the biggest problem was Back in those days, the streets of Manhattan weren't very good. Once again, we're do using horses and carts. They're loading these batteries onto horses and carts, bouncing them through the streets of Manhattan back to the lab where they would be weighed. Well, guess what? The amount of electricity was proportional to the amount of buildup. When they weighed them, it was always inaccurate and customers were getting bad bills. Some of them too little, some of them too much. Sound familiar? Nobody liked that. This meter was an unmitigated disaster, absolutely a disaster. Um, the Thompson recording watt meter, on the other hand, becomes important. So what was the issue with the direct current that Edison was using? Well, as we know, you got a lot of losses when you try and transmit that power. You start going up to a mile and you got huge losses, all right? You also couldn't change the voltages, all right, when you were transmitting the DC. It was a big problem, all right? Enter Mr. Westinghouse. So Mr. Westinghouse, remember I said in the 1870s, what are we using electricity for? We are using it for telephones and telegraphs. That's pretty much all the use. Incandescent light bulbs come in in the late 1870s into the early 1880s. The arc lamps start to become more popular. Mr. Westinghouse gets into it. He's a financier, but he hires a lot of bright guys and they say, hey, you should, you're, in, you're probably going to be interested in this transformer that uh, they have in Europe. Maybe you should buy the U.S. rights. So he does. He's smart enough to realize right away that the, uh, that, the, that the world is not going to be about telephones and telegraphs. All right. It's really going to be about lighting and motors. So he reorganizes the company immediately to the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. All right, he hires a couple of bright guys, a Mr. William Stanley. We'll talk about him um, in the future. And one of his progeny uh, ends up forming the uh, Stanley Morgan Finance Company. Mr. Oliver Schallenberger, he's important for a couple of different things, uh, including our induction watt hour meter. 
Um, he was in the Navy. The Navy back in those days, just like now, who's big into nuclear? The Navy has always been, in, been big into nuclear. Back in the 1870s, they were big into electricity. They knew that electricity on ships was going to be very, very important. So he wants to work on, elect, on this new industry, the electric industry. So he resigns his commission and joins up with the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. All right, Stanley and Schallenberger, these are the two gentlemen, notice how young they are. Everybody in those industry, in, that, in those days who are, are getting involved, most of them are pretty young because this is a brand new industry. The first universities are actually having courses in electric, what is a, basically the, uh, the beginnings of electrical engineering, all right? So these guys work on a new transformer design and they come up with a whole system. By the late 1880s, they come up with a system that they can, and they build one, just a mock-up, a model, that has generators, transformers, and high-voltage transmission lines. Why is this important? This is important because they show it off, not only to investors for Westinghouse, but to prospective customers, one of whom are the guys planning the World's Fair in Chicago in the early 1890s, all right? AC has none of the issues of DC. Voltage drop in long lines and lack of an easy way to increase or decrease the voltage? Nope, they don't have that problem. They can transmit for long distances and they can actually change the voltage if they need to, all right? But there's no good meter out there, so if they want to commercialize it, they're going to need a good meter, all right? Edison, in the meanwhile, he still doesn't think much of AC. Fooling around with alternating current is just a waste of time. Nobody will use it ever. Edison goes on. He is so anti-AC, okay? He is so anti-AC. In the 1890s, he starts, remember, he also made the movie camera, right? He came out with movies. So he starts taking movies of how you can electrocute and kill animals. He starts with dogs and cats. He moves up to horses. One of his most famous videos, he takes a circus elephant that is retiring, because um, circus elephants, when they retire, all they do is eat for 23 hours a day, so they're expensive to keep. Well, if the circus doesn't want them, they basically used to, for the most part, they would butcher them for their meat. So Edison, gets an old circus elephant, and in a very famous video clip, he electrocutes and kills the elephant. You would think that that would horrify people, and he was trying to demonstrate how dangerous alternating current was. What the general public got out of it was, hey, wait a second. If we can kill elephants, we can kill people. And what did we get from it? The electric chair. So yes, the electric chair, Unwittingly, Thomas Edison helps to invent the electric chair because it is considered a more humane way to, uh, to, to kill people with capital punishment. So it kind of backfired on him. All right, Mr. Ferraris, <clears throat> he figures out the concept of a rotating magnetic field. Well, this is pretty important because now you can have motors. You can use electricity to create power, can't you? Okay. So he proves that this can be done. Well, at the same time he's doing that, so is Nikola Tesla. The two of them, when you go back and you look at their notes, they're coming up with the same ideas at the same time in different parts of the world. They're not really corresponding. They're not talking to one another. Just independently, they are figuring out AC power, okay? Um, they come out and file for their patents at virtually the same time. Tesla was just, I think, days earlier, and Tesla also had a slightly bigger name at the time. He wins the patent infringement suit. So we all hear about Nikola Tesla. Nobody hears about Galileo Ferraris, even though he came up with many of the same ideas, all right? We come up now with <clears throat> induction type motors, which really paves the way for induction type watt hour meters, all right? Um, Tesla, 
Tesla is a very interesting guy. He is brilliant. He is arguably the most brilliant of our new breed of electrical engineers. He is actually one of the first people that goes to university and studies what becomes electrical engineering. Um, he's from a an upper middle class uh, Serbian family. His father was actually a priest, I believe, um, in the uh, in the Orthodox Church. Um, He's not hurting for money, though. He comes from, like I said, a fairly well-to-do family, goes to university. Tesla, though, is terrible with money. He is a horrible, horrible businessman. Uh, ends up dying actually penniless, unfortunately. Made and lost many fortunes over his life. His hero, as he's going through university, is Thomas Edison. Absolute, absolute idol worship for Thomas Edison. He comes to the U.S. with something like a few pennies left in his pocket, goes right to Thomas Edison's place, says, I want to work for you, Intr you know, has a letter of introduction, says, I really want to work. I want to show you all about my new ideas for AC and for induction motors. Of course, Edison's not too excited about AC, but says, well, tell you what, I need help working on my uh, DC um, generator. OK, uh, that's what I really that's what I really need work on. Uh, work on and I got to figure out how to transmit a little bit further because I can't afford to put a new generator every mile in Manhattan. I've got to figure out how to how to do a better job. So they reach an agreement that as far as Tesla's concerned, they reach an agreement that a year later, Tesla was going to get a $30,000 bonus, which is huge in those days, and Edison was going to fund his AC work. So Tesla goes to work, solves Edison's problem, comes out with a better DC motor, better way to transmit it, goes back to Edison, and Edison allegedly says something like, you stupid immigrant, I'm the brains around here, you work for me, we're gonna do DC, I don't give a darn about your AC, and you're not getting your bonus. Tesla gets a little upset, he quits. Edison gets a little upset, he blackballs him, makes sure that nobody else in the industry will hire him. The only job Tesla can get is digging ditches for a year while he tries to find an investor. The ditches he's digging, ironically, are to lay the cables for the new DC motors and generators that he's developed for Edison that can now go further and need more lines. So for a year, he spends digging ditches. Goes back, though, to Mr. Westinghouse. Mr. Westinghouse meets him, recognizes what he's got, and pays the equivalent of over a million dollars for his patents, making Tesla a very wealthy man, which Tesla really doesn't care about. Tesla just wants funding for his research. Westinghouse is very happy to provide funding for his uh, research. He already has our, our friends uh, Schallenberger and Stanley working, and remember, they've come up with a whole AC model generator, Transmission lines, the whole works, everything. They've got it all working. In 1893, the World's Fair, though in those days, the World's Fair were big deals. It stay, stayed open for a whole year, and the whole world literally visited. This one was billed as the Electric World Fair. It was all about lighting. So whoever won the contract for lighting that World's Fair, it was going to be huge. Because of Schallenberger and Stanley's model and Tesla's help, they win. So the Westing, Westinghouse wins the World's Fair. Edison loses. Because they win the World's Fair, they get another little contract for putting in the first generators at the Niagara Falls power stations. If you go to Niagara Falls, there is one statue at Niagara Falls when you go to the National Park there on the U.S. side. And that statue is to Nikola Tesla. All right. So... Westinghouse treats Tesla very well, and they have a great partnership. Um, there was a movie that came out just a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it was the Battle of the Currents or, or something like that. And it actually stars Edison, Tesla, Westinghouse, and it also has Edison's financial backer, who is J.P. Morgan. Those four men are the four key stars in that, in that show. All right. So... Westinghouse gets the contract for the powerhouse at Niagara Falls, and it's over. AC has won. It's just, it's just plain over. They can produce 
enough power in Niagara Falls, they start putting transmission lines all the way down to New York City. All right. So power, uh, one of the largest, in fact, the largest tunnel ever made in North America uh, on the Canadian side of the falls. They just finished pouring about five, I think, six years ago. They bored a tunnel on underneath the town of Niagara on the falls. They bored a tunnel and all that tunnel does is it pumps water from the river upstream at night when the power is basically free and they they pump that water back into the river so the next day during the day when they need the power they've got more water flow over the falls and that was a multi-billion dollar project and it was paid for pretty quickly just by the increased generation by pumping that water up niagara falls still produces an amazing amount of power for us as you as you guys all know all right so with, a, with AC winning, we need electric meters. We need them badly. It's the 1890s. We have to have good, reliable electric meters. The chemical ones, they don't work. The motor meters, yeah, okay, they work okay. The intermittent registering meters, they work okay. But the induction meters are what win the day. They're only for AC, and they are absolute predecessors of our modern electric meter. That is the direct ancestor of our modern electric meter. Okay. Uh, our Thompson Houston guys, uh, they end up working. These guys all know each other. Um, Ronald McDonald, Charles Coffin, I mentioned them before. Um, Thompson Houston guys, they moved to Fort Wayne to help uh, with a new arc lighting system. Why? because they were told, pick up guys, you're moving to Fort Wayne to help these guys on a new uh, arc lighting system. One of the guys that moves from the East Coast, uh, from Massachusetts to Indiana is Thomas Duncan. Okay. Um, in Fort Wayne, one of the things that they have to wor worry about, okay, is a meter. All right, here's an early one, the lamp hour meter, great. Um, Mr. Slattery here comes up with a, an early meter. Uh, but it's kind of discontinued by the 1890s. It's not really as reliable. Remember, we discovered that they needed to be robust. Mr. Schallenberger, who is one of the guys that came out with all those transformers and the generators and the transmission system, he's working with an assistant. Spring falls out of an arc of a new arc lamp, comes to rest inside the lamp. Before they can pick it up, he notices that the spring's rotated. The same sort of thing that Ferraris and Tesla had been working at, and he realizes, hey, it rotated due to the electric fields. He then realizes that it's probably directly proportional, and he comes up with an induction style meter based on that concept. In the 1890s, Westinghouse sells over 120,000 of this type of meter. If you think about the number of people in America in those days and the number of people that were able to get electricity connected to them, these guys dominated the market. They absolutely dominated the market with an induction style meter. Notice how it's got the uh, notice how it's got the the clock looks like the dial faces. Back in those days, they figured well. If you, you could have five dials and that would register, or seven, and that could register uh, watts, or four would register kilowatts, why would you ever need more than uh, four dials for kilowatt hours? Who could ever possibly use that much electricity? Okay. Um, there were other meters that were coming out. Thompson came out with a recording meter. Again, same thing, the, uh, the seven versus the five. If you notice, this particular one has six. He was just doing watts on this one. The nice thing about the recording watt meter was that it actually worked for DC, whereas the other one only worked, the induction meter only works for AC, okay? And pretty soon by the 1890s, this type of meter is only being used for DC because the induction style meter has taken over. All right, General Electric. Let's talk about good old General Electric. Everybody thinks of Edison as the founder of the General Electric Company. Not quite true. Mr. Edison had a financial backer, okay? His backer was J.P. Morgan. Back in those days, J.P. Morgan is so wealthy that about 10 years later, the U.S. government 
is going bankrupt. JP Morgan bails out the U.S. government because he has a lot more money than the U.S. government. That's how wealthy he was. So Thomas Edison has a lot of ego, a tremendous amount of ego. He likes to be the brightest guy in the room. He really likes that idea. Um, JP Morgan comes to him and says, you know, we should probably start rolling up some other company companies and we should start joining them together. Like with the Thomas Houston company, we should probably, we should probably join with them and we're going to form a new company. Edison was not very thrilled with this idea. JP Morgan really liked this idea. JP Morgan had all the money. So Thomas Edison went along with this idea. So they formed, they merged the two companies and eventually they end up buying a tremendous number of companies on the strength of JP Morgan's vision. That's the original GE logo there. Uh, you can see the G and the E. Um, and they ba and he basically goes on an acquisition spree. He wants to buy up the best and the brightest and bring them all together. He wins a lawsuit about the light, the light bulb patent. That was a pretty important patent. Lots of people had come out with light bulbs. Edison came out with the one that people liked the best and lasted the longest because of its filament. So they win the patent on the light bulb, but in large part, they win the patent because JP Morgan can hire the best patent lawyers in the country. That was huge for them. Okay. Mr. Stanley, okay, he returns to Barrington, Massachusetts. He starts the Stanley Instrument Company. Um, he starts selling watt hour meters. Um, this meter is unique because he used mag a, ma a magnetic gap instead of the traditional jewel bearings. So this is the 1890s and we have jewel, ball jewel bearings to float that disc or magnetic gap. Those designs stay in play well into the 1970s and the 1980s and the magnetic gap is still really out there on a lot of your meters. There's not so many jewel bearings there. Um, got here, Tesco once upon a time was the biggest seller of aftermarket jewel bearings. I went up to do a job for Central Maine Power back in the, oh shoot, I don't know, it's gotta be 20 plus years ago. And they had these in the back of their cabinet that they gave to me. It's an ampule full of about 20 jewel bearings that are also encapsulated in their own glass ampules. Um, and you would, once upon a time, when you brought a meter back, you had to rebuild the bearings with these, with these units. Um, so this, these designs originate in the 1890s and stay prevalent and important in our industry through the 70s, 80s, and even still exist out there in the, uh, in the field today. All right. These guys all know one another. Uh, you can see Mr. Stanley here uh, sitting in the back. Um, Mr. Edison is winning the Franklin Medal. Why the Franklin Medal? Because Franklin is one of our first uh, scientists involved with exploring electricity, all right? William Stanley's son, Harold Stanley, he finds Morgan and Stanley with J.P. Morgan's grandson. So again, they all know one another. They all end up working together. All right, Thomas Duncan. So Duncan eventually forms Duncan Meters, which becomes Landis and Gear. Um, as many of you guys know, it's out in Lafayette, Lafayette, Indiana. Why was Duncan out in Indiana? Because his boss said, pick up your stuff, you're moving. You're going to help the Thompson Houston Company out in, uh, out in Fort Wayne, or the Fort Wayne Company out in Fort Wayne. Um, he actually comes up with the first induction meter. He designs it, builds something in 1892. Nobody is sure why, but he doesn't do anything with it. He doesn't patent it. He doesn't manufacture it. He comes up with it, seems to think it's a pretty good idea, and for whatever reason, never pursues it. Okay. Um, several other guys are also working on it, but Schallenberger is the one that comes up with probably the best approach, comes up with a design that is effectively used right up through um, again, through we, we stopped making electromechanical meters in the early 2000s. His basic design was still being used through that time. His first meter, this is a picture of it, 
was 41 pounds. It was one of the most expensive ones of the day, but it was built like a brick outhouse. Um, it was very robust, but it weighed a lot of money. It was very expensive to build, but it was extremely reliable and very accurate. He does refine it, okay? Um, he eventually brings it down to less than half its weight, okay? Um, but initially it was more than twice as expensive as the competition, but it didn't matter. It was really good. He comes out with what we call the cyclometer or the dial. It looks like an odometer on your car. Again, seven of them if you're measuring watts, four of them if you were measuring kilowatts. This effectively becomes our modern day meter and he had it in the mid 1890s, okay? He has a whole series of them that he comes out with between 1894 and 1897. And as I mentioned earlier, Westinghouse ends up selling 120,000 of them, which means that they were really the best game in town and just about the only game in town. All right. Um, pretty, pretty basic design, two coils, braking magnet. Um, again, they also use jewel bearings because you wanted effectively a frictionless disc spin. And the end result is for every revolution, the disc measures the same amount of energy. And that was key. For every revolution, the same amount of energy. What do we call that? We call that the case of H, the watt hours per disc revolution. So all you had to do was count the disc revolutions and you got watt hours. It was pretty simple. That's how all of our meters work. That's really the basis for how they still work. Okay, let's talk very briefly about Mr. Blondell. Why is he important? Because for polyphase watt hour metering, it becomes a little more sophisticated. Again, young guy. Why is he such a young guy? Because they were all young guys. These are the new breed of electrical engineers. It's a brand new industry. He realizes that if you have N wires, three wire system, a four wire system, you gotta have N minus one watt meters. So for a three wire system, I need two watt meters. One of the problems with 2S meters today is it's a three wire system with a single watt meter. 2S meters have a problem. They don't accurately measure our electricity if you start moving away from a power factor of one. They really don't do a very good job. Mr. Blondell knew this, and for polyphase meters, he understands it. Um, Mr. Schallenberger, he, he designs a new system for his polyphase. Uh, he puts two discs in, because again, he needs two watt meters, but he puts them too close together and there's interference there. So it's less accurate, all right? Late 1890s, we got a patent war looming between Westinghouse and GE. They are about to clash. And these are Mr. Westinghouse and Mr. J.P. Morgan, right? Mr. J.P. Morgan comes to Mr. Westinghouse and says, hey, George, we ought to set up a board of patents. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna license each other's patents so they can't come after us for monopolistic patent for monopolistic practices because you and I both have them. But we're going to really keep everybody else out of this, or we're going to license it to them for an exorbitant amount of money. So George looks up and says, "Well, JP, that's really good, but I've got all the AC patents. Those are all the valuable ones. Yeah, you got the light bulb and all, but you got all these DC patents that aren't worth very much. Why in the world am I going to give you all my stuff? That makes no sense." And JP Morgan says, you're right, George, you're absolutely right. But my patent attorneys, and by the way, I've hired all the best ones. So if you're thinking that you may be able to hire some good ones, you can't because I've already got them all hired. My patent attorneys tell me that <clears throat> our case is gonna drag on for 10 to 15 years between court battles and appeals, etc. And they also tell me that you're gonna win. You will absolutely win this, uh, this patent battle in the courts. But I've also had my financial guys looking into your finances. And George, you're going to run out of money about halfway through. And God, that would be a shame for you to run out of money halfway through that battle. So I think it would be better if we just set up this board of patents. And George Westinghouse, being the shrewd businessman that he is, he suddenly agreed with J.P. Morgan. And so they set up this board of patents. Great. Why is that important? Well, because George had the best design on a meter. Schallenberger, meanwhile, he's taken that 41 pound meter. He's gotten it down to 12 pounds, all right? 
Duncan develops a watt hour meter for the Fort Wayne Electric Company where he was working. GE buys him out. They want that. Okay. So now we got a couple of other guys. Duncan comes up with an integrating meter. Okay. Um, but it doesn't, he goes to work for a company out in Chicago. That company, there's a strike. They go, they're starting to go belly up. And guess who buys them? GE buys them. Mr. Duncan, they decide to move Duncan back to the East Coast. And he says, now, nah, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to start my own company in Lafayette, Indiana, called the Duncan Electric Manufacturing Company. Guess what he's going to make? He's going to make meters. So he comes out with a couple of meters. Great. He's starting to starting to get into the uh, starting to get into the business. Um, he probably gets a lot of his inspiration from Thompson Houston because when they had a fire there, they all worked together in Fort Wayne. Um, so he learned a lot from those guys. But he's coming out with his own meters. Westinghouse, meanwhile, comes out with the first polyphase meter with two single phase meters in a big case. Um, with two discs. That design, Westinghouse uses that design almost unchanged until 1969. All right. Sangamo Electric, who becomes Schlumberger, who eventually becomes ITRON, they start shipping their first electric meters. Westinghouse comes out with a type A meter. That's our, our A base meters. Okay. So it looks like things are taken off. Except in 1903, Westinghouse sues Sangamo and Duncan. They say that they are infringing on Tesla's patents. Remember, Tesla had that good induction motor patent. They say the induction meter is infringing on that patent, and they win. So Westinghouse and GE can stay in the metering business. Sangamo and Duncan and a few others have to get out of it until 1910. Okay. Uh, Sangamo tries to stay in the business, uh, and they do. They come up with a, uh, a mercury motor meter in use in England. It's not really a very good meter, but it works. Uh, and they're able to stay in business. Same thing for our friends at Duncan. They come up with another kind of meter. They're not very good, but they at least struggle to stay in business. Well, as 1910 is approaching, Suddenly, everybody realizes, oh, shit, a lot of new people are going to get in the business besides just Westinghouse and GE, who are pretty much in lockstep. So now we got to come up with standards. We need safety standards, accuracy standards, reliability standards, security standards, and we got to have some level of interoperability. Sound familiar? Okay, so we got to come up with these, these standards. All right, but you got existing practices, you got proprietary standards where everybody has something a little bit different and patents are a big thing. You got to figure out what's the vision for the industry. You got to build on that vision. You got to get a consensus and you got to hammer out a heck of a lot of details. All right. So they start forming. There's a couple of associations out there that have been in play for a couple of years. These associations are who are going to take the lead in forming these standards. You got the National Electric Light Association. This was formed by our good good friends at the Brush Company. All right. Um, these guys, it's all about the arc lighting. It is vendor dominated, not utility dominated. All right. They have an operating uh, committee. These guys are very big. They're very flashy. If you look at their symbol, V equals IR. Okay. Or uh, it's V equal IR or I equals V over R. Um, so they have big flashy meetings. Uh, they want a lot of publicity because it's vendor dominated. You also have the Association of Edison Illuminating Companies, AEIC. These guys eventually um, become part of our EEI, uh, Edison Electrical Institute, ironically. These guys, the AEIC is still there and is part of the uh, EEI uh, committee. When we have our every six months, the ANSI committees meet and they meet in conjunction with EEI and the AEIC metering committees. All right. These guys, only Edison franchises are allowed to join. That's all. Those are the only people that can join. And it's all about the utilities. That's who this one is for. Okay. So big and flashy. Um, all about the vendors and the products. This one is small, focused all about the utilities. All right. 
They want to promote the use of stuff. They want to promote arc lighting. They want to expand electrical systems. They don't care whether it's AC or DC. These guys want to, um, it's a mutual protection group of the electric system operators. They're focused on incandescent lighting. They want to standardize all the electrical systems to be just like theirs. All right. So who comes to these? Well, of course, Edison. Um, Westinghouse goes to the other ones. Lord Stanley of the Stanley Cup. Thomas and Houston, okay, actually are big promoters of this one, even though they're working with Edison, okay? These are some of the owners of some of the uh, electrical, uh, the electric utilities, all right? Tesla had a great, uh, a great quote, I don't care that they stole my idea, I care that they don't have any of their own. As you can imagine, people are borrowing and stealing ideas all the time, there's lots of patent wars, some are successful, some not so successful, all right? AEIC committee, Mr. Alex Dow, the Edison Illuminating Company in Detroit, he helps to really promote that. Um, he actually was very involved with the other side of it, with the brush company. He helped to, uh, with the lighting at the World's Fair, which is how he ends up staying on and working for uh, a city-owned electric company. All right. Um, what are some of the things that they're talking about in these early AEIC metering committees in the 1890s and early 1900s? Well, they're talking about time of use versus demand. They're talking about emerging technologies and R&D, prepaid metering, battery storage. A lot of the things that actually, frankly, were on some of our recent agendas for the AEIC metering committee. Um, the, uh, meanwhile, on the other side of thing, the NELA committee, all right, um, they start covering a lot of the same kinds of things, all right? They're working on the first national electric code, all right? These guys are also working on the same code. These guys start working on a code for electric metering, and they're working independently at first. They finally realize they've got to work together. They must work together to come out with a code that will work for all of the vendors and all of the utilities. Makes sense. Notice the date that they actually have their, their first meetings that produce something. So they've been working for almost 10 years, not getting very far. In 1910, they come out with all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> Why 1910? Because that was when the patent was up for GE and Westinghouse. 1910 is when everybody and their uncle is gonna start jumping in and a lot of the patents, especially for meters, are gonna run out. So now Sangamo and Duncan and a bunch of other folks can get back in to the industry. So shockingly enough, that's when we come out with our first code for electricity meters in 1910, just ahead of when everybody can jump into the industry. All right, based on that work, they come out with the first electric meterman's handbook as they're trying to standardize on this stuff. One meeting was on the East Coast, one meeting was on the West Coast. Still what we try to do today, we try and alternate between East Coast and West Coast, stopping in the Midwest every time, every other time we come across the country. All right, so who's at these meetings? Well, General Electric, GE, and they're still at those meetings. Westinghouse, who becomes ABB, who becomes Elster, who becomes Honeywell, they're still at that. Fort Wayne, who ends up getting bought by GE. Sangamo, who becomes Schlumberger, who becomes Itron, they're still at those meetings. Duncan, who becomes Landis and Gear, who becomes Landis Plus Gear, they're still there. The Eastern Specialty Company, Tesco, yep, we're still there. Cutler Hammer and Biddle, Leeds and Northrop, states, these guys still contribute in a lot of ways, not necessarily to these meetings, but to other ANSI meetings on the electric side. So a lot of the same companies are still there, all right? Right after that patent expires in December 1910, Sangamo launches their meter, they call it the Type H, all right? And Duncan, 20 years after he first developed it, he comes out with his Model M. What are Landis and Gear meters still prefaced with? Oh, you still hear about MX and MS meters, don't you? All right, we had the M1 and the M2. These all came from these meters that really started, that he started delivering in December of 1910. I know you're shocked, but both Duncan and Sangamo were ready to ship the day the patents expired. 
and they had orders. All right, so pretty quickly, 1920s. What happens in the 1920s? All right, um, polyphase meters are redesigned uh, to move the terminal chambers from the sides to the bottoms, okay? Also, big thing, two types of compensation, temperature compensation. Meters originally did not have temperature compensation. That wasn't very helpful anywhere in the northern parts of the US or in Canada, all right? So now we have temperature compensation. Overload compensation means that the meters could handle a broader range of loads, okay? Modern meter can handle 200 amps with a nominal rating of 30. Why the nominal rating of 30? Because before overload compensation, our self-contained meters could only handle a maximum of 30 amps. So what are the test amps on most self-contained meters? The test amps are 30 amps. That goes back to the early 1900s because before overload compensation in the 1920s, that's all they could handle. By the way, polyphase meters, guess where they were most accurate? They were most accurate at five amps. So what do our transformers work at for all transformer rated meters? 200 to five, 400 to five, 800 to five, 2,000 to five, 8,000 to five. We bring everything to five amps because that was the sweet spot of those early polyphase meters from the 1890s and early 1900s. Westinghouse also introduces the first socket type meter in the late 1920s. It's not real popular yet, but it's an idea. 1930s, something huge happens in the electric code. We, uh, we move the meter ahead of all the switches and fuses. This is important for two reasons. One, it's a lot less likely that you are going to be able to steal or tap into the unmetered part of the electrical service. And it allows you now to move the meter outside of the house and not necessarily in the basement. Doesn't mean everybody does it right away, but now you can do it. Why do we have so many electric services in people's basements? Because when the electricity first came to those homes, that's where the meter was. That's where you could put it. Well, now you can actually, starting in the 30s, you can move it outside. And by the late 40s and early 50s, that's where most people are moving them, okay? Um, the other thing that happens is everybody's making their own type of meter. They, to wire a meter into a house, it's literally wiring the meter into a house, kind of what they do still in Europe. All right, in 1934, these metering committees get together and they come up with socket-based meters, S-based meters, A-based meters or bottom connected. They also had B and C-based meters, um, which are shockingly still out there. Um, but this makes the meter change outs a little simpler, especially for the B, the C and the S, all right? The A-base is still a little bit of a pain, but at least it's standardized, all right? Um, Sangamo introduces the last prepayment meter. I think I had a picture of one. There we go. On the bottom right, that's a prepayment meter. For any of those, for those of you who are as old as me, maybe, or a little bit older, you can maybe remember going into an aunt or an uncle's house or a grandmother's house. Those meters used to be right inside the door on the right-hand side. You could put a dime in there, crank the meter, and you would have power for 10 cents. If you look at some of the old Charlie Chaplin movies, um, uh, the tramp, he has a little a sidekick who's a young kid, and the young kid gets some more electricity by putting a dime with a hole in it and a string, puts it in the meter, pulls it back out, gets some new electricity. Still in power. Okay. Um, uh, let's take a look here. All right. Again, more improvements to the meter design. Polyphase meters has some new designs. They come up with new uh, braking magnets, new... Uh, um, new discs, and this continues on for a while. 1940s, GE comes out with a new type of bearing, or they're working on a new type of magnetic suspension, but it is uh, put on hold due to the war, but is perfected after the war. GE opens a new plant in Summersworth, New Hampshire, which is where they, uh, which is where they have still been. They come out with the I-50 meter, the predecessor to the I-60, the I-70s. All right. Duncan relocates to Lafayette, Indiana, which is where Lannis and Gear still is. Um, GE moves the rest of their stuff to Summersworth. Westinghouse goes down to Raleigh. That's still where uh, Elster Honeywell's offices still are. Um, 
Meter designs, pretty much everybody abandons the metal base by the early 50s, and they've gone to that compression molded bases, which is effectively the, uh, what we still have with injection molded bases, all right? Um, Duncan, Sangamo, Westinghouse, all have meters with magnetic bearings in the 60s. In the late 60s, the, the single phase meter undergoes its final change and it has that lower profile meter. That is what we can, that most of us were familiar with uh, growing up through the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, you would have seen this type of meter. That's really what our current electronic meters still look like. All right. Um, and these things are a lot lighter. Now we're down from that original 41 pound meter, we're down to a pound. I know I'm running just a little bit over, so I am just about done. I promise. Um, 70s, Landis and Gear buys Duncan. Um, they keep the name uh, Schlumberger, or they change the name in the, they keep the name originally, change the name in the 80s. Schlumberger buys Sangamo, um, move the plants to Winston, uh, South Carolina. They're still in South Carolina. Um, that's where they're still making, uh, making stuff. A few guys start coming out with electronic registers and automated meter, automatic meter reading. In the late 1970s, they're just pioneering it. Uh, by the mid 80s, we're offering hybrid meters. ABB buys out Westinghouse's meters in 1990. Um, AMR is introduced. Communication modules are introduced into the meters. That's a cyclometer meter that I mentioned. They were always somewhat popular. They're more popular on the aftermarket now with uh, marinas and uh, RV camps and things like that because it's easier for people to read. Um, 2000s, the, the last electromechanical meters are produced. AMI is introduced and a host of new communication vendors enter the market. The first AMI deployments start around 2007 or so. Landis and Gear becomes Landis Plus Gear. Schlumberger becomes ITRON. Census, who is a gas and water meter manufacturer, enters the market for electric meters. Why? Because they wanted to sell their new communication devices. ABB becomes Elster, who becomes Honeywell. GE becomes Aclara. So all of these folks have roots that go back a long ways. Census's roots go back more to the gas and the water. Um, these four guys, their electric metering roots go back to the 1890s. All right. Um, so with that, we come back to Ben Franklin. Um, at our users group, as I said, we'd like to have Ben uh, come. We are having, we are hoping, we are hoping like the rest of you guys, we are hoping that we're gonna get back to meter schools like the North Carolina Meter School and others. Uh, we're hoping that we're gonna get back to our users group and we're hoping these are all gonna become in person. Um, we're still planning ours for July. We'll see what COVID and vaccines and political situations allow us to do. Um, if not, we are going to continue with the Tesco Tuesdays. Um, we've got a whole lineup here that'll take us through early April. We're hoping that by early April, we'll know more about what the rest of the year will bring and whether we can go back to meter schools in person, uh, users groups in person, or if we'll continue to be virtual. But we've got a whole bunch of new topics. Groundhog's Day next Tuesday. We've got metering configurations um, and why you use them to uh, meter forms test switch operations and hot sockets, meter testing in the field, transformer rated testing, user pickups and probes, ratio burden admittance and DMAG testing, traditional rate, uh, and we do that in two parts, um, realizing your investment in technology through analytics, this is more about AMI, shop testing, preparing for AMI deployments and communication equipment. So again, these are really designed to be intermediate level, maybe a little bit of late intro, uh, 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 intro, but intermediate level and what we call advanced or current topics. So that's the idea. If you're able to sit in on all these sessions, that would be great. If you've got ideas for sessions, we heard from a couple of people that they might want some more basic ones just for some new guys. If you want that, let us know and we'll do something separate, maybe on a Thursday or something for a bunch of folks who are new to the industry, brand new and want just some real basics. So tell us what you need. We came up with this lineup of things based on the feedback we had from our fall set of Tesco Tuesdays. They were very popular. And I will say that we had almost 50% more people sign up for the ones that started today. So we're really excited. We're pleased that you guys are getting something from it. We really appreciated all the feedback that you guys gave us as to what you liked 
and what you didn't like and what you wanted more of. And while we're all still virtual, we're hoping that you'll join us on Tesco Tuesdays. Andy, anything else? Thank you very much. Um, that was fantastic. I see everyone in the scene who had a great um, presentation uh, listening to you there. Uh, if you want to open it up, I don't know if you have time to hang and have any questions you want to address with Tom. You can see them either in the chat box or just kind of uh, mute yourself and we'll, we'll stay on a little bit longer for have to go. We do appreciate you hanging on a few extra minutes as we move over the noon hour here on the East Coast. But um, again, we'll yep. stay in a few more minutes with questions. Uh, and Tom, if you have anything else to add. Sure. I mean, I mean, we love to talk about metering. So if anybody wants to talk about it, happy to answer questions. But my email is up there. If you got any questions in the future or if you want a copy of the presentation, we're going to post it on the website. But if you got any questions, let us know. I really like this presentation because it gives beginners and experienced guys a much better background into why the heck do we do what we do? Who are the meter manufacturers? Where do they come from? These guys have been doing these things for a very long time. There is a rich history of what we've been doing and the industry has always move toward the most robust solutions and things that are very accurate. And that hasn't changed. These guys want robust solutions. Your metering solutions are very robust solutions. Again, we're happy to talk about this stuff. Shoot an email if you have more questions later on or if you just want a copy of the presentation. Thank you all. I'll hang out for a few minutes. It saves me from going back to doing real work. <laughs> and we will be posting the presentation on tescometering.com slash Tesco Tuesdays. I put up. And as always, like we said, you can reach out to us. So great to see you. And I think you're getting some questions there, Tom. And then I'll go back to you. When did demand metering start up? Demand metering started up in the 1890s. Um, and there was a huge discussion in those original committees about whether the industry should move to time of use or demand metering, all right? The time of use guys, their argument was, hey, every time we get more customers that are trying to use power at eight o'clock in the morning, we've got to put in more transmission lines. We've got to put in more distribution lines and it's killing our infrastructure. Every time we get an incremental growth in our users, we have to invest way more money in our infrastructure. So we want to charge people based on when they are using. We want to move people away from the peak hours and try and get them to start using power at two in the morning and three in the morning at eight o'clock at night. We want to move them away from our peak times. The demand guy said, nah, 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 we don't really care about that. We want to just socket to the user if they use a lot of power in a very short period of time those are the guys that we want to get we want to hit we want to kind of level out our loads a little bit better and if we can do that over the course of the day we'll be in better shape time of use guys came back and said even if you do it if everybody maxes out their usage at the same time you still didn't help the time of use guys probably had it right but the demand guys they had all their friends on the committee so guess who won the demand guys won it wasn't about how good your idea was necessarily. It was really about who you knew, even back then. So demand metering went to the forefront over time of use in the eight, in the late 1890s, early 1900s. But both of them have been around since that time. Were the first demand registers thermal-based? The first demand registers were not thermal-based, but that was a really early design. And those designs persisted Shoot, I've seen thermal, but there are still thermal based meters actually out there, believe it or not. Um, there are even still meters. Remember the old uh, circular charts? Those meters are even still out at certain generating stations. Those are still out there. So it wasn't the first, but it was early on in the design, yes. Let's see. All right, any other questions, Andy, that I missed while I was while I was talking away? Okay. 
All right, guys. Well, it's 10 past, and I know we do have to get back to uh, real work. If anybody's got any other questions, please, we're, we're always happy to talk about this. When you see us out at meter conferences and meter schools, when we can all get back out there, feel free to come up to us in the hallways at our table right after a presentation. Um, not only myself, but a lot of our regional managers, John Carroll, Rob Reese, Vernon White, Kevin Farrell, Dan Hollow, Harry Lawton, um, Jim McGill, these guys like to give these presentations too. They love talking about this, st this stuff. So when you see us out there, buttonhole us, ask us your questions. We're, we're happy to talk about this stuff. All right, with that, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna sign off and we look forward to seeing you guys uh, next week, next Tuesday, Groundhog's Day. We'll see you for Tesco, another Tesco Tuesday. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.